Uh, we're going to show you once again the breadth of informatics about uh, the kind of people we bring in for the, this kind of talk. We've got J.J. Prescott here from the Uni University of Michigan Law School. He's a lawyer, a law professor. Um, the reason he's here is Gary saw an announcement at the University of Michigan. We still are on their mailing list. He saw an announcement for J.J.'s talk at Michigan and said, oh, we got to have him here. So I called him, wrote him, and he said, okay, and so he's here. <laughs> so uh, J.J. has a very interesting background. He has a uh, Stanford undergraduate in uh, economics and public policy. He's got a J.D. from Harvard. He was, on the, was an editor of Harvard <coughs> Law Review. And he has a PhD in economics from MIT. That's a pedigree. Mm -hmm. So we're very delighted to have JJ Prescott here. Join me in welcoming him. Uh, thanks very much. And um, Judy, thank you so much for um, inviting me. So um, as I've, I've mentioned to a few of you that I've talked to today, uh, I don't normally give talks in uh, informatics departments, so my goal today is essentially to tell you about what we've been doing um, in Michigan. Um, I, uh, as Judy mentioned, I'm a, I'm a law professor. Uh, I'm going to talk about some technology uh, that I've been working with a team to, to develop, um, and, uh, and there's you know, a whole story about how that happened, and hopefully it will come out. Uh, throughout, but I, I basically want to start with the problem and, um, and go from there. If you have any questions while I'm talking, please just uh, raise your hand and I'll either, you know, Mike will come to you or I'll repeat your question. Um, I'd like to, you know, I'm happy to clarify uh, uh, or answer anything along the way. Um, uh, and I have a bunch of slides, probably too many, but, you know, you know I always feel like it doesn't seem like I have enough uh, to go for the entire talk, so we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, so the problem, I mean, the story here is I'm, I'm just a regular old law professor teaching classes and, and writing papers, and um, I have a student who, uh, who I start having conversations with about uh, trying to do something in the world uh, 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 to make it a better place. And our conversations eventually lead us to an interesting fact that, and, and this fact has actually gotten a lot more press in recent years uh, because um, of some of the police violence uh, that's been going on, uh, especially in, in Ferguson, where some of the underlying um, concerns uh, uh, that have been pointed to are outstanding warrants. But you know, five years ago, when I started this whole process, um, there were uh, over a million outstanding warrants in the state of Michigan. There are tens of millions of outstanding warrants uh, in, the, in the US. And by warrants, I mean an arrest warrant, but not an arrest warrant for a felony. Because um, usually, if there's an arrest warrant for somebody who has an out, you know, has a felony charge against them, uh, the police are are looking for them, trying to trying to bring them in. These are really for people who who can't pay can't pay fines and fees. So they owe money to a court to the government, um, and they haven't paid. Now, of course, there are probably some of them who just don't want to pay and have the means. But in reality, we know that that's that's not even close to the typical case. There are people who owe. Five hundred thousand dollars, and just don't have that money, right? So they don't really know what to do when you owe a lot of money and you can't pay it. Uh, so they they allow the issue to fester, and eventually it turns into a warrant. Sometimes also people miss court dates, and so they get what's called a failure to appear warrant, and um, uh, and they essentially allow um, you know courts issue a warrant, and that warrant winds up causing a lot of problems both for them and for the court, really, because there's an outstanding issue, sort of an unresolved situation between the court and the government and a citizen, okay? Um, and uh, mostly about money, but also about rescheduling sometimes. But um, what do we know about these warrants? So a large percentage, as, as I mentioned, result from the fact that people just don't have the money to pay. Um, in general, this process of, of issuing a, a warrant for somebody's arrest because they can't pay affects people who can't pay. Right? So it has a very regressive effect. People in this room generally aren't going to wind up with a warrant like this. Um, and what's worse is that as you sort of let it fester, uh, fines and penalties build up so that it becomes a little bit like um, owing money to a loan shark. Like you, you, know, you might be trying to save money to, to, to collect enough to pay off the uh, the amount you owe, but, um, but what you owe is going up faster than you can actually get the money 
um, together. And what's interesting about this is that it need not be this way, okay? Because if you actually take the average judge and the average person with a minor warrant, you put them in the same room, and the person says, listen, I, you know, I make $150 a week, I don't have $1,000, and I don't know what to do. I have an outstanding warrant, I, I don't know what to do. I cannot pay $1,000. Says that to a judge, the judge will say, yeah, you can't pay. So let's, let's recall the warrant, and we'll, we'll figure out some other solution. Either I'll lower the amount you owe, or I will put you on a payment plan, or something. But we can get to resolution. We can move forward, so there's not this sort of wound, um, but instead something that's starting to heal. Of course, it, you know, it's not great. In a lot of these cases, somebody gets on a payment plan. Payment plans aren't necessarily great either, because you know, there's still people who oftentimes can't really afford to be sending a lot of money uh, to the courts, but it's a much better situation um, uh, than it would otherwise be. Um, we know that this would usually happen, so why doesn't it happen? Um, because getting those two people in the room at the same time is very difficult. Okay, that's, that's really the basic problem, is that there is a resolution that would be pretty easy to have, but we cannot get the people in the room to resolve the issue. Okay? And I'm gonna explain why, why, that, why that is, why there's a problem. Okay? The other thing that we know that kind of points in the direction of the solution is that <clears throat> the offers that judges make when you do get into a room are oftentimes quite simple. Okay? It's, not, it's not that difficult. It's not a, a two hour conversation. A lot of times it's, okay, well, if you can't pay, can you pay 5% a month? Can you pay 10% a month? Okay, that's it, let's do that. Okay, so it's, a, it's usually pretty easy to get to um, a solution, and actually judges or prosecutors, if it's a situation with a prosecutor, they don't need to know very much in order to figure out what they need to do. Just usually a few facts about the case, maybe about the person's history, um, but there's not a lot of information being collected through the in-person interaction between the two. Okay, so why don't these offers occur as we might expect? Why aren't there more resolutions? Well, there are just a bunch of barriers, and you can, you know, this goes under a bunch of different names, but we might call this sort of barriers to access to, you know, limited access to justice, barriers to accessing the courts. Um, call it bargaining with the courts here. It's people who, who, who can't, for whatever reason, don't have the means to resolve, um, <clears throat> Uh, resolve their outstanding issue. So there are obviously some just some straight up monetary challenges for people who have outstanding warrants or even other kinds of outstanding issues, such as just civil infractions. Fines, fees, and other transactions costs. So this is literally money out of your pocket. Um, missing work. You know, you have to go down and meet the judge um, to resolve the issue. Courts aren't open at midnight. Uh, they're open, if you're lucky, from nine to five. A lot of times, um, even during those hours, there you know, you know the right decision makers aren't available um, uh, to have these kinds of meetings. Uh, so you gotta you gotta miss work, and a lot of times you have to take a whole day because you know you're going to show up, and it's not as if the judge has got you on their calendar. You have to wait in a long line that might take many hours. Um, so um, uh, uh, in practical terms, you, you know I'm uh, I. I'm a law professor, I'm on salary, I can take a day to deal with something like this, go down and waiting, well, I don't really enjoy waiting for four hours to have a short conversation with a decision maker, but somebody who earns wages, you know, they're essentially missing the opportunity to make money. And so it's a strange regressive feature that the, if you're on salary or the better, better off you are financially, the less costly in some ways um, this is. And that's not quite right because of course the the, uh, uh, the monetary value of some people's time is worth a lot, but for somebody who, who is living from paycheck to paycheck, taking off half a day or a full day, to be able to have a short conversation with a judge means that we're charging them, you know, $7,500, $150 to do what it costs me nothing to do, okay? At least uh, in terms of out of pocket, okay? Costs of finding um, child care and family obligations, so it's, uh, it's oftentimes the case that people are taking care of children. Um, we know of examples where courts won't, won't uh, meet with people who bring their children to court. The 
kids are disruptive or whatever, they're waiting around for five hours, it's not surprising. So you might have to leave your children behind, that's costly. Transportation costs are significant. So in a place like Orange County, well, you know, obviously you have to deal with traffic, but courthouses are not that far away. But in a lot of places in this country, it might take you two or three hours to get to the local um, courthouse. And if you don't have a car for whatever reason, um, getting to a courthouse itself is actually um, quite difficult. Uh, and as I mentioned already, courts aren't open all the time. So you need to know precisely when they're open, when they're likely to, to be able to deal with your issue. Um, in my local court, I've done, you know, I've had a traffic ticket and had to go down and speak with a prosecutor about it. And there the standard was, you know, show up at 8.30 and get on a list. And then we'll essentially work through the list. And, you know, uh, if it doesn't, if we don't get through everybody by 5 p.m., you'll be on the, f the first on the list next time, which doesn't really doesn't sound exciting as a way to spend your day. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, if you can't make it there at the right time to sort of get on the list, I mean, you really, it's, it, in some ways, it's kind of a fragile system, okay? Now, what about um, non-monetary uh, uh, constraints? And this is actually huge. You wouldn't think this would be quite so important, but quite frankly, for a lot of people who are dealing with these issues who don't have the money to pay tickets or have outstanding warrants, um, they don't, they don't really know what, what they've done or what they can do. They don't know what their rights are. They don't, you know, if they have questions, they don't know who they should ask. They can't afford a lawyer. Um, so there's just a ton of confusion. There's also a lot of fear and anxiety about going to courts, right? Um, I don't have that, um, that fear. And actually, I, I find courts a little bit intimidating myself. But the average person actually um, really feels like they're potentially walking into a place where their life could change dramatically for the worse. And if you have an outstanding warrant, or you, you know some kind of decision is gonna be made that's gonna have lasting consequences, um, that generates a lot of fear and anxiety, okay? A lot of people distrust the system, okay? So they think that even if they show up, um, force themselves to get through their anxiety and make the um, connection, uh, that it's not gonna go well for them. Uh, they usually don't have lawyers. There are potentially language barriers. So what do you do if uh, you, you, know, you can't, don't feel you can communicate uh, well because of uh, the language you speak? Sure, courts are supposed to provide translators, but it's not as if one's waiting there when you show up. That requires a whole nother layer of process. And finally, um, the difficulty of presenting your own case. So we have this belief that um, the opportunity to sort of present to a judge and explain your story is a wonderful right, and it is. But actually, it's terrifying for a lot of people. Okay? I, um, I, I, I remember uh, being in a court watching uh, uh, a number of uh, people essentially uh, plead guilty to misdemeanors, and a probably 19-year-old kid who was being prosecuted for possession of marijuana, and um, he walks up and he's like, you know, I want to plead guilty, and there's 75 people staring at this guy, and a judge looking down from, you know, something like this at the kid, and he's got his head down, and he's, I just want to, just want to plead guilty, I kind of want to get out of here as quickly as possible. And the judge is looking at the, the, the guy's record, and it's clear that this is the first thing on the guy's record, that he doesn't have anything else. And the judge says, you know, did you talk to the prosecutor about this? I mean, are you sure you want to plead guilty? I mean, have you talked to the prosecutor yet about um, whether or not maybe there's something else, some other way we might be able to handle this. And he doesn't want to quite say what he really meant, which is there's no, you don't need to plead guilty to this charge, right? You, you don't have a, a history here. Like, we can get you to something that's not going to be as damaging to your future. And the kid just couldn't, wouldn't hear him. He was just like, I just want to plead guilty. I'm sorry, I, uh, sorry about what I did. <laughs> and uh, the judge is like, but I really think it would make sense for you to talk to the prosecutor. Do you want to take a little bit of time and go talk with the prosecutor uh, about this? Because, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is a, no, I don't think we have to resolve this right now. You know, everything he could say without basically saying, you're being dumb, don't do this. And the, the kid just didn't hear it, was clearly terrified of being in front of all those people. And, um, and so while there are certainly some people who want to have, uh, people who want to tell their story and have their way, uh, you know, have an opportunity to explain their case, Doing it in person in front of 75 people sitting in court is not necessarily the optimal way. There are potentially lots of other ways that people can present their, um, uh, their case. So, um, so that's why it doesn't happen. 
That's why uh, we, we have people with outstanding warrants and a lot of people who get civil infractions who want to who want to do something about it, but they just they just the court is not theirs. They don't they can't access the court. They can't um, <clears throat> interact with and find real solutions with with the decision makers. It's just it's there's just too much uh, that has to happen in order for that to work well. Um, so, and this matters actually. I mean, there are real. So if we're talking about warrants, for example. Um, People do essentially what you'd expect them to do in this situation, which is they just ignore it. They know they have a warrant. A lot of them know they have a warrant. They don't really know what to do with it. They can't pay. Um, so they just kind of live in the shadows. So they live in constant fear of being pulled over. Um, if they walk into court to try to resolve it, they're worried that they'll be arrested. Of course, that's very unlikely to happen. But if you have young kids, I mean, are you going to, if you're a single parent, are you really going to take? even a 1% chance that you might have to spend two days in jail. So there's a lot of fear. Um, as a result of the fear, uh, they engage differently than the rest of us do. So they don't, they don't vote, they don't call the police, they don't report for jury duty, which gets them in even further trouble. And all of that's because they essentially want to avoid any possibility of somebody realizing they don't, you know, that they have an outstanding warrant, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the longer this lasts, the more the the penalties go up. So there are real, um, real um, consequences of these outstanding warrants. So a million people in Michigan, <coughs> tens of millions in the US, just sort of fester it. People who don't vote, who don't call the police when they need them, and so on. Uh, now the traditional process is, as you might imagine, it's all it's the same way it was 100 years ago. Um, go to the courthouse, wait to set a hearing date. Now you can oftentimes do this on the phone, when I had to set an informal hearing date, I called and I said, I want to have an informal hearing. And they said, okay, you can come on May 13th at 2.30. And, uh, and if, you can't, if you can't be there May 13th at 2.30, that's it. So we're going to set that time. If you have to miss it, if anything changes, too bad. You just have to, you know, you have to, you, you, you're, you're going to miss your chance. Uh, so you got to do that, then you got to go back to the courthouse, wait to see a judge, which could take many, many hours. Maybe that you don't actually get to see the judge, you have to come back again some other time, and the judge makes a determination. Um, we've, in Michigan, the Michigan Online Corp uh, project has been about trying to essentially use platform technology to allow people to communicate and access the courts without all of what we just saw. All right, uh, not, not, that's not quite true because they still have the penalties and the fines they have to pay. Um, and they, you know, there's still an outstanding issue that has to be resolved. But um, at least for 60% of what courts do these days, which is handling these minor issues, showing up in person is really just not necessary. Um, not all people feel that way. There are judges and courts out there that feel that this really must be done in person. Parts of it must be done in person. And where that's possible, where that's true, um, you can build a platform that I'll, uh, you know, that I'll, that's configurable so that where judges or particular courts think that in-person interactions have to happen, they can happen. But a lot of courts and judges don't think that. They recognize that with an outstanding warrant, um, very traditional standard outstanding warrant, it's really just about getting the person on a payment plan or reducing the, the fine um, with, a, with a, a civil infraction like a speeding ticket. There's three or four things they need to find out and that's it. Doesn't matter, they don't have to look you in the eyes. They don't have to, you know, you don't have to wait four hours. They just need to know those four or five things and it could be done. So, um, uh, so here's how I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how uh, the platform we developed works. Talk a little bit later about how we got here. Um, please ask questions along the way. But essentially, there's nothing really tricky here. It's kind of how you think it should, should work. You know, a defendant who has an issue, a litigant, a citizen, imagine this for all different types of cases, they basically enter basic information, the kind of information that's going to allow the system to identify who they are and find their case, okay? Um, the system then, this platform we've developed, then uh, checks this litigant's eligibility. So um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how that works uh, uh, in a second, but there are certain cases that courts or judges may not want to go through the system, so it checks to see whether or not they're eligible. Um, if they are eligible, the defendant requests a review of their outstanding warrant or of their civil infraction or, um, or, or at least begins, you know, depending on the case, that begins the engagement with the court. Um, 
whatever the court or the judge or the prosecutor wants to know is you know that information is collected it's combined with other data and information um, uh, that the court or the state um, has about the case and passes it along to the right decision maker the flow the specific flow depends a lot on the transaction in question but um, for a, a traffic ticket for example it, it might go to a prosecutor or law enforcement and it will provide the information the litigant has offered to them give them also their driving record the pieces of information that the law enforcement officer or the prosecutor says this is what I need in order to make the decision okay they make a recommendation or they make the decision sometimes it has to be confirmed or affirmed by the court so after the information goes to the law enforcement officer law enforcement officer makes you know provides their input it then goes over to the judge who in some cases needs to sign off. I mean, one thing we've learned in this project is that it's done very differently, at different courts, and, and certainly across different states. Um, and the court basically accepts or approves um, the deal or rejects it, okay? So what just happened? The person essentially went to court and said, you know, I, he, you know here's what I want to happen, here's what I think, these are the things I want to tell you. So they, they answer questions that the court wants to know, but they also have an open-ended opportunity to, to make their argument. They write it out right now. In theory, they could, they could record a video um, uh, uh, and send it to the judge. Uh, they're, uh, you know, I should stress that this is not in lieu. I mean, this is not um, a replacement for in-person process. If the person doesn't like computers or doesn't want to use this system, all of the normal options are available. But for those people who feel like this is actually much easier for them, people who can't take off work, who have childcare responsibilities, who feel like they can write a solid paragraph that actually explains their situation much better than others, uh, than, than actually standing up in front of 75 people, um, this, this, this is likely to be a lot better. So um, access is, is much enhanced, so open at all times, no travel required, easy to use, and you still have your opportunity to be heard. It's in a different way. It may not work for everybody, but there's a subset of people at least that will prefer this. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about accuracy. So right now, um, judges and prosecutors make decisions based on this 30 second interaction, where a lot of times they have a couple of pieces of paper in front of them. Uh, and, and that's maybe not ideal. Maybe we really want to have distilled information um, that is uh, uh, targeted for the particular type of case. Uh, there are um, you know, there are some real fairness potential advantages here. So what's different about um, interacting with somebody online? Well, they don't necessarily see your race or your gender or, uh, or your, your physical attributes. So um, potentially uh, there are some real advantages there. It's also a much more transparent system. Um, and finally, uh, there's a sort of indirect benefit. So I mentioned that, you know, somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of what courts do so when you see long lines in courts they're all dealing with these minor cases minor infractions they're just there to talk about some um, uh, fine they owe uh, maybe resolve a warrant but more likely they're there for an informal hearing about it a civil infraction um, that makes the courts just busy you know it, it, it occupies a lot of the uh, the court officials time and attention and if they were using um, their time more efficiently there'd be um, but the courts would presumably operate better when people did have real need to interact with the judge when face-to-face um, uh, -face, uh, hearings were necessary, okay? So this is sort of the value of online case resolution to courts. Yep, it saves time, resources, and manpower. Um, it does maintain judicial discretion, judicial and prosecutorial discretion. I really want to emphasize this. I'm going to emphasize it a couple of different ways. Um, this is a configurable platform, but ultimately the only thing it, it does is connect judges and prosecutors with citizens or litigants, okay? Um, there are screens that, are, that can potentially be put in place by judges, but they're the same screens and criteria that they use in their regular interactions with people. And, um, and at all times, they can, you know, they can decide to say, you know, I'm not gonna deal with this case this way. If you wanna deal with this case, um, you want me to address this case with you, you need to come down in person. So it's an opportunity, it's a tool to potentially enhance the discretion, um, not uh, to, uh, to sort of cabin what prosecutors and, and, and judges can do. 
Okay, it's an additional an additional path for citizens to resolve cases, and of course everything goes much faster. So here's just some basic impact and cost saving numbers. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm, really loud. I'm going to cough up next time instead of down. Um, uh, uh, so uh, you know here, um, you know uh, for a hearing, you know, the, the, you know, 157 minutes of combined court and staff time. Okay, drops to roughly 27 minutes. Okay, with when you use the platform, we've now we've now in Michigan we've helped over 5,000 citizens. So over 5,000 people have gone through resolved outstanding warrants. We also do civil infractions like um, parking tickets and um, traffic tickets and, and so on. Um, right, sort of adding case types all the time. Um, in Grand Rapids, we've actually. Uh, work for them to develop what um, is what we call sort of an, an intervention in, in an early intervention uh, process in uh, warrants. So these are people who are about to have a warrant issued, and so we we you know this, essentially the court reaches out to them and says, hey, you're about to have a warrant issued. This may be because you're scared of coming to court, uh, or because you can't get here, um, but you know you can go online and use this platform to connect with us and uh, you know if you issue uh, a failure to appear warrant um, it takes the court a lot of time to actually issue to do all of the process to actually issue a warrant four and a half hours and um, with the system if you if you let people know this Grand Rapids actually has uh, it's reduced its issuance rate by over 10 percent okay, so a lot of people get these things they don't they don't use it they're still gonna wind up with a warrant it's a real challenge for us, and I'll talk a little bit later about outreach, how we convince people. This is actually where we'd love some, some feedback from you. How do you convince people to kind of use this system, to interact with government in this way, and to, um, and to convince them that it's actually safe and legitimate? But already we have pretty significant benefits, um, even when we're just kind of trying a real um, simple, um, a simple uh, straightforward first, uh, first try. So there are a lot of stakeholders. So one of the challenges of this platform is just who you need um, to, to, to approve. So in, in, when we first started off, uh, we just find a, a couple of judges who might be interested in trying this. But of course, um, judges uh, don't run courthouses. Uh, court administrators run courthouses, and their staffs uh, actually, you know, they, they, they're very worried about um, workflow and realize that judges might make changes that make their lives miserable. So you need both judges and court administrators and uh, staff to, to be on board. Where you're dealing with a change in a, um, the status of a charge, so let's say a, a civil infraction or a minor misdemeanor, you need to have prosecutors and city attorneys who are willing to interact with people in this way through an online platform. Um, uh, likewise, law enforcement, who, you know, in, in, with civil infractions that are of the traffic variety, usually uh, police provide at least information, if not making decisions. Um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, there's a finance question here, too. So um, even if you get all those parties um, interested in doing something this way, you also have to convince uh, the people who write the budgets that this is a good, this is a good thing uh, for their citizens, right? Because, um, uh, you know, it's software and there's... Uh, um, well, something they have to purchase. All right. So here's here's how how it's gone in Michigan. So in 2014 in May, we, we set up our first pilot uh, where we just did civil infractions. Uh, in um, in September of that year, we started in the 74th District Court, which for those of you who know Michigan, <coughs> is Bay County, so uh, an entire count a courthouse that serves an entire county, uh, and they actually included a warrant module. So that's when we start, first started uh, resolving outstanding warrants. Um, since then, you can see we've been kind of steadily adding courts over time, and we have been adding things additional. You know, every time we talk to a court, we talk with them about what their biggest challenge is, and are there other case types or other situations where they see this as a potential advantage. So that was the source of the early intervention with warrants program in, in Grand Rapids. Um, we also now have a parking module in East Lansing and others that are now interested in that. Turns out that there are a lot of people who want to come to court to fight a $30 parking ticket. <laughs> and uh, you know, the East Lansing Courthouse was having night, you know, they had to have judges come in at night to hold these hearings. 
Um, and you know, people would drive from Chicago to contest a parking ticket. And they wanted to be heard, and that's an important part of this. But you know, it turns out a lot of them are happy to be heard uh, with a written statement. Um, and so, so things have been working out uh, really well. We've had um, uniformly positive interactions. Once we get people on board, and I'm happy to talk, take questions about that process, because it, it was a challenge to, to, to convince courts to try this out. Um, uh, but once on board, we've really turned them all into, um, actually, their best, our best salespeople. I mean, they kind of talk to their judge and court administrator friends about how, um, how much, well, how easy it's been to work with us and how much better it's made on um, their processes. But I figured I'd show you a little bit of how it actually um, works. So, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, eligibility is determined. This is, we've set this up, we've designed it from the beginning to be entirely configurable. So we walk into the courts and we say, this is how, you know, the 30th District Court in Highland Park does it. This is how they have their language. This is how they want to present the system. But you get to draft all of this language. So you, you know, make this your own. Um, and then we talk to them, okay, what kind of cases do you want to deal with? And are there certain limits? You know, if you're going to deal with traffic cases, do you just, do you want people who've had four tickets in the last six months to come through this, or do you want to force those people to come into court if they want to do something about it? And, uh, and so they, they, they pick a number of eligibility factors, all, all at their discretion, put them in. Um, um, and, uh, and, and this is sort of what a, this is what a, a defendant will see. So this is the Highland Park screen. You know, in Highland Park, you can do traffic tickets or warrants. Spent a lot of time working on this language and um, can't really read it very well here, but um, for those of you who are interested, especially for those of you who are interested in user experience and um, you know how to really you know, draft uh, the kind of you know language where you're interacting with um, citizens to kind of convey uh, legitimacy and um, ease of use, um, we would love to to talk with you about um, what we're doing here. But um, so you know they go in, they basically do a, a search. And if they're eligible for review, um, it pops up and it says, okay, you know, here you are. You've got a ticket, um, speeding five miles over, your fine is 126 bucks and you're gonna get two points. Okay, most courts in Michigan, most courts, most places, will allow you to request an informal hearing. And that would involve you coming down and kind of explaining, this is your chance to explain. And as I mentioned, you know, that can take all day. So um, if you wanna request review, you can now do it this way. Um, now, one of the things that we did early on was we realized that, you know, if you get a ticket, right now the ticket, on the back of the ticket, it gives you, um, it gives you the, the, the website or tells you to go to the court um, website if, if you want to use this platform. Uh, but if I get a ticket, if I don't kind of deal with it within the next day or two, I might not deal with it at all. Okay, so one of the early things we did was, um, allow a person to go on, no result found, your ticket hasn't yet been added to the system. Okay, put your, put your information in and, when, you know, when, and we'll run a search um, continually until we find your ticket. And then we'll send you a text message and an email or whatever you like um, and alert you that now you can use the system, okay? Um, kind of go in and uh, they basically are expected to answer questions. These questions are determined by the court. Um, a lot of cases, the courts just want to look at your driving record and hear your explanation. So there's not a lot of questions. This is also totally configurable. Sometimes courts want to know, would you be willing to go to traffic school? Um, the thought being that if you say no to that question, probably, you know, you're not the person we should be um, uh, uh, giving a break to. Uh, so they ask questions trying to learn more about you. And, and here is their, their reason for request, just open text explanation of what's going on. And these have been, um, these kinds of uh, stories here have been really incredible. I mean, sometimes they're short and sweet, um, but a lot of times they're, you know, they, they really provide an insight into what the challenges are for these people. Um, uh, uh, indi you know, indicating, for example, like I, I work during all of the hours you're open. I've been trying to figure out a way to get there. I just can't, I can't get there. It's too far away, um, and so on. Um, this is a situation where somebody cannot pay what they owe. So this is a, a form that sort of complies with the court's normal information requirements for getting onto a payment plan. All right, and uh, and you know you can have that payment plan accepted, and then in order for the deal to stick and for the warrant to be withdrawn, you got to make your first your first payment. Okay. Can I just um, ask you a quick yeah. question. Um, so with the tr with the driving record, 
Is that linked to, say, DMV, whatever yeah. that, or do they have to actually produce documents to show? Because that, to me, seems like that could be a major barrier right yeah. there. And yes. then secondly, on the money, is there are there any kind of proof requirements? On yeah. That? So um, on the first question, this system, I haven't mentioned this, but I should have. We, um, we actually hook in, in Michigan to a, a state-level data warehouse um, uh, that <clears throat> allows us to pull driving record out and provide it directly to the decision maker. Okay. So um, I'll show you in a second what that looks like. But basically, um, when it pops up for a judge, you can essentially click through and see their driving record. So it provides it right there for them. We're in the process now of setting up, we have a, uh, uh, an agreement in place with, uh, with the DMV in Michigan called the Secretary of State in Michigan, which is kind of confusing, so I'll just call it DMV, what you guys know it as. Um, uh, and the same sort of thing. So we can kind of pull, and this is one of the advantages of a platform like this. It can, in, you know, it can in theory distill and pull in a lot of the information in a much easier way than having a clerk who's actually like kind of printing out pieces of paper for a, for a prosecutor to look at when the prosecutor's meeting with you. Um, and then, yeah, so on the, uh, uh, on the uh, 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 documentation, that's clearly something that you know is, is in the future for us. At this point, it hasn't been required, so no court has actually wanted to have that. They're willing, based on these yeah. these answers, um, you know, you're submitting this to the court, so right. you know it's not you don't you don't want to lie. Um, but we suspect that in the future, you know, it, one easy thing to add would be just you know take a phone picture of your payment stub uh, or something like that, and, and that's that's functionality that I you know will basically add when a court. Wants, wants it to be added. Um, uh, uh, so, okay, so the defendant then, oops, am I going the wrong way? Yeah, so this is what the, the prosecutor of the court uh, liaison looks at. Essentially, it's like an inbox, okay? And um, they go in, and, and, and it's, it's funny, as we as they start working with this, they'll, they'll handle it like 7.30 in the morning before they start their day, or they'll help, you know, at, at 10, in the after, you know, 10 in the morning on Sundays, they'll just say, oh, I'll go through my, through my requests and, and deal with them now. And actually, one of the things they can do, so here's where you can actually see the, the history. Um, they, they have the opportunity to communicate with the litigant or with the citizen. And, and, and we have a number of judges who actually were quite thoughtful. Here's the reason why I'm denying your request, or here's, here's how, what, what you need to learn from this experience. Um, and that's actually been really great to see, too. Um, not all judges do that, but some of them do. And I think it's actually great. Uh, that judges are, are, are doing that. Um, uh, same here, so this, I think I was just showing the prosecutor one, um, but judges basically have a very similar, um, a, a similar setup. They also have the ability to kind of approve and reject and to send a note um, uh, to the defendant, okay? Um, and then what happens is essentially you get, if, if your deal has been, well, and when a decision has been made, it's communicated either by text or by email, and then you have to follow through. So if you don't, if you don't follow through, it's kind of like walking out after the judge offers you something. You got to follow through. Um, so you have to accept or reject the offer. <coughs> um, uh, and <coughs> here you can see see some of the information um, uh, that the uh, other that the, the prosecutor or the judge actually sent to the defendant. Okay. Um, so uh, benefits, as I mentioned, I'm going to get. Uh, I don't have too much more time left, so I want to get to um, uh, some of the research we've been doing. But essentially, allows citizens to go to court. I think you should see that now. I mean, it's been hard for us working out the, the workflows of these things, but actually, once you work them out, um, they um, it's pretty straight uh, forward. Courts do it differently, but um, you know now. Um, in, uh, I should, by the way, introduce N.J. Cartwright. She has wor is working with me on this project, so she's a great person to um, put any technical questions to or any recent information. But I think, like now in Michigan, we can get if a court is interested in, in using the system, we can get them up and running. If they're going to give us the language to put on the site, we can get them up and running in about two weeks. Um, so it's actually fairly you know, it's fairly easy to get going. Um, uh, law enforcement obviously spends a lot less time. Mediating cases and showing up. Same with prosecutors; uh, they can just handle it in a. Um, you know, of course, they can they can force the citizen or not force them, but require that the citizen come in and um, speak with them in person. But if they think that's not a, it's not a case where that's appropriate, they can handle it much more quickly. All right. Um, so uh, I have a couple of here's a couple of um, uh, data, uh, a, a couple of uh, data points from our first. Okay, so like this is you know, similar to the information I gave you before, but it used to take a uh, month, month or two to schedule a court hearing. 
Uh, each hearing took 40, 60 minutes because they would be in a setting where they were mediating with a, with a judge. This is actually quite short. They would have to come on a very particular day and meet with a police officer. So it was a little different hearing. But now, um, now combined court staff time, 157 minutes, now everything just happens much more smoothly. Um, and obviously this translates into significant savings. Um, there are also a lot of harder to measure benefits, as I mentioned, uh, potential uh, uh, um, reduction in implicit biases and so on. Um, and also, as I mentioned, uh, potentially provide much better, more targeted information to judges and prosecutors to make their decisions rather than um, just a, uh, a, a standard set of um, data. Okay, so on the research side, um, uh, we've been trying to, in addition to just kind of basic outcome measurements, trying to figure out like how this improves things for the courts, but a number of other kind of uh, directions we've been going. So, um, uh, and I want to say a little bit of something about how this all started. So, um, the University of Michigan supported this idea as essentially a problem in the world, and it was interested in putting money towards a solution. It's not a research grant. It was a problem-solving um, grant, and that's actually been great, though, because we, you know, in addition to, 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 to having a bunch of people who are working on sort of the technology, we're, we're involving students and faculty in, in research that can come out of um, uh, this. And it's tough. It's a challenging area that has made it difficult for a private sector company to come in because, um, uh, you know, it's scalable. Um, but if it's not, it, it's a scalable, you know, you can set this up in every court, but you have to design something that's quite flexible because courts are really quite different. Um, and there needs to be a lot of attention, at least in the beginning, um, uh, to figuring out what their um, needs are. So uh, in terms of primary research areas, we've really been focusing on reaching litigants in their communities. So it's one thing with a traffic ticket, but with an outstanding warrant, there are a lot of people who don't know they have a warrant. And so you set up a new system, a new way for them to access the court, but if they, they don't know they have a warrant, that's a problem. If they know they have a warrant, um, but the court is, but they're not, can, you know, they're not in touch with the court, the court doesn't have current information for them, how will they find out that there's now a new way for them to potentially uh, to, to, to deal with their warrant? Um, we also are very interested in how do we set the system up so that people feel like it was a fair process? Okay, that they understood what happened. I mean, a lot of times if you go in, talk to people who have informal hearings, um, they go in, a decision is made, they pay, you know, they, they understand a final decision has been made, they pay or they, they do whatever they need to do, and you kind of ask them what happened, and they, they actually don't know. They know it's done, they don't actually know what happened. Um, they assume they haven't been cheated, but they don't actually, they're not certain, and so that's not a great feeling. So we really want to to make sure that the system works in a way that people understand, it's very transparent, and they feel like they were treated uh, fairly. Right? Um, uh, there's also some projects we have about improving prosecutorial decision making um, and, improve, and developing efficiency success metrics for courts. I'm probably not going to talk about that. So on the outreach, unless you have questions, on the outreach goals, we needed to really worry about uh, or, or work on ways to, to, to let people know of this new approach. Okay. Um, so we, we thought about various ways of doing this. Maybe we should reach out to faith groups, um, businesses, um, maybe see if we can use some standard skip tracing methods to locate individuals and, and contact them. Um, uh, you know, in the amnesty context, uh, there has been, so, you know, if you're going to have a, a non-online uh, platform amnesty program where you just say, okay, you have an outstanding issue, we're going to advertise that if you come into a church, We'll handle your problem without arresting you. Um, uh, it turns out that some of these, you know, faith group uh, barbershop approaches have worked fairly well. Um, you, you know, you have the amnesty program operate in a church. If the if the if the person who has the outstanding warrant is a member of that community, um, it it um, convinces them that it's legit uh, and it works pretty well. But we kind of wanted to test test that. The other thing we were a little bit worried about is, you know, the digital divide concerns. Um, in this context. So, um, you know, we do traffic tickets and not, not surprisingly, people who have tablets and cell phones that, um, that, are, that, that allow them to access the web might be able to use all of this technology very easily, but if some of the poor members of our communities um, just don't use it or don't feel that it works for them, we might actually wind up with a, a system that um, increases, you know, may help them on average, but increases the, the inequality and maybe ultimately interferes with their perception of 
uh, fairness. So um, anyway, so let me let me jump to some quick results. Uh, so we tried a bunch of different things, and here's what we did. So this is Highland Park. This is a bunch of outstanding warrants. And essentially what we did was we, we, we chose a bunch of zip codes where we had approximately similar demographics and similar numbers of outstanding warrants. And then we, um, we deployed some of these outreach um, uh, approaches differently. Um, so some places we did flyering, in some places we, we set up a, a call bank and we sort of located using uh, uh, search technology most recent numbers and we, we called them and let them know. Um, what's going on? See, we kind of, you know, um, set up essentially a differences and differences design here, so we can kind of identify which methods were working. Um, and as I mentioned, the existing literature really stresses building trust in communities through community organizations. But here we actually had some mixed results, um, uh, and this may have a lot to do with the technology aspect of this. So, you know, if if you're actually going onto a web page for the court. Maybe you don't need to be as convinced um, by, let's say, a faith-based group that it's going to be okay. And also, you're not self-surrendering in the same way, right? Like, you know, if you show up in person, you're really surrendering yourself. Whereas an online option, may, you know, maybe you're willing to try it out and see how it goes. And you, you know, you know that somebody's not going to bust down your door um, uh, if you try it. All right. Well, we had mixed success. Um, I could talk more about this in questions um, if you like, but I'd say definitely phone calls were the most successful. Um, so um, I'd like to try ways to kind of increase the efficiency of that uh, process. Um, actually, in some ways it, it worked even better when there was, a, there was an existing amnesty program that started partway through our test period. It seemed like the combination of hearing something about an amnesty program and then getting a phone call together caused people to really go online. But you'll see here that we had, you know, we had 7% of people who, were, who received a phone call actually go on and resolve their warrant. Which is actually remarkable um, to me if you think about how difficult and how old some of the how difficult it is to convince people to, to engage with the court and how um, how old some of these warrants are. Um, and there are some reasons to think that uh, that we're actually underestimating some of the effects of this. Uh, and I, last thing I'll say because I, I want to make sure there's some time for questions is we're in the process um, of running some uh, of running a, a survey project um, with Cliff Lampy uh, and a graduate student at uh, University of Michigan where we're essentially asking some standard questions of users of the system. How do you perceive the process? That it seemed like you were treated fairly and so on. <clears throat> Part of the, the design is going to include some comparative surveying of people who don't have access to the system. So identify essentially people who would have probably used the system um, but didn't have it available to them and try to, um, try to see uh, what, um, uh, what they uh, view the normal system as being like, um, but we found some interesting features just about who is using the system taking the survey. Women are using it more often, or at least are uh, taking the survey. Heavily skewed towards younger citizens, not, not surprising, um, really, but um, something we need to, to keep in mind going forward. Um, and more than 40% of the people who, you know, who filled out the survey um, claim that they, they found out about um, online case resolution through their local court. And we have some basic correlations here, and they're not, they're not surprising this way. These are very preliminary, so like I, I, I hesitate to even interpret them, but I, I'm gonna put them up, up here. That um, you know, ease of use of the system is highly correlated with perceptions of uh, procedural justice and perceived fairness. Um, and of course, whether your request was approved. So there's some outcome uh, uh, aspects here, and if your, uh, your request wasn't approved, you don't feel quite as enthusiastic, but even so, if you found it easy to use, um, that's all right. Uh, I mean, it's, it still was more, you know, more likely to make you feel like you were getting fair and um, uh, fair treatment, okay? Negative emotions are correlated with um, a lot of uh, bad things. Why uh, the traffic cases? I don't know, and I don't actually. There's an extra, an extra yeah, decimal point in there too. Zero point zero point. And, that, and that's strange because I, I thought I corrected. I thought I, I actually tried to edit that, and it's strange. It's still there. Makes me think I'm showing you the wrong set of slots. Um, but uh, uh, that I don't know, and I, it's. Um, I mean, nobody. You no, know, if you're dealing with a warrant, my guess is, the fact that you even have an opportunity to maybe resolve your warrant may be so positive. I'm not sure. You know, most of the people that are filling these out are traffic cases anyway, so I'm not sure I put much um, weight on that at all, really. But anyway, so I'm, um, um, 
I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and answer some questions. We have some, some other <coughs> uh, stuff that we're hoping to learn uh, from uh, the survey sort of about trust and legitimacy, but it's about very preliminary. I just want to really let you know that it's ongoing. And if and any of you guys are interested in conducting research through our system, you know, we really are capturing all of the interactions between citizens and the courts. We'd really love to hear um, what you have in mind because um, it'd be great for us and hopefully it'd be great for you um, too. And I'll leave, I'll leave off some of the um, judicial decision-making um, uh, stuff. So, uh, uh, questions? Oh, thank you. We're going to pass the mic around. Questions? <clears throat> your uh, one of your opening slides are laid out a whole bunch of reasons why people don't do things. And, you yeah, know, being unemployed, uh, not, not speaking English and very well, and so on. I don't think those would all work against many of those things. Would work against this system yeah. because being unemployed, not speaking English, et cetera, et cetera, lower education, and so on, are, are reasons why you wouldn't be on the internet. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with that. And so the question is whether or not some of the benefits wind up outweighing those. Um, sort of uh, main effects. Uh, and and it, it, you know, it's clear that one of the things we're gonna have to do going forward is, is start to deal with, uh, with language issues. Right now, we're, you know, we present this in English. If you walked into a court, that's what you'd be faced with, English signs and people speaking English, and you could get a translator, but it would require time and effort. Um, but, you know, um, but the nice thing about this is you don't have to drag somebody along. So let's say you speak a foreign language, you don't speak English. If you want to deal with somebody in court, you actually have to bring a friend. And having a friend who speaks English who will sit with you on the couch and help you work through English on a phone or on a tablet is likely to make it much less of a, a barrier. So if, if people were on there all the time, they had to do this three times a day, every day, it would be a much bigger issue. But being able to go on just once with an English-speaking friend um, presumably makes it, um, I think, much less of a burden than the alternative of going all the way to the courthouse. Now, um, of course, that's always an option. So if you can't, this terrifies you or you can't read any of it, you can always go down to the court. So it's always just an additional option. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and, and this is just sort of generally true with um, lack of education or um, lack of sophistication. I mean, I think in many ways, um, I don't know if we're there yet, but um, we're going to be better able to, con to, to describe the process in um, simple, straightforward language. I and mean, there's been a lot of, um, at least in, in the criminal justice area and, and access to justice domain of using cartoons to explain concepts. And that's just never gonna happen in a, in a, in a courthouse. You're gonna walk in and maybe they'll, they'll, they'll hand you a sheet, but you're probably gonna talk to a person and that person is going to tell you something that's close to what they told the last person who asked. There's not gonna be no uniformity. They're, they're not gonna have a checklist to make sure they tell you everything you need. So, so it's my, my belief that there's actually a lot more potential here to deal with those issues than relying on in-person um, uh, approaches. Hi, really <coughs> fast. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but recently there was a AI developed called Ross. Not because yeah. this school, but then the uh, lawyer that the AI lawyer that's been hired by Baker and Hostler. Um, yeah. As things like this develop, where we can uh, kind of digital dig digitize a lot of the duties of a lawyer, how do you feel like that will play into what Matterhorn does? Yeah. So um, I mean, I think the sky's the limit here. So one of the things we actually um, thought early on about trying to incorporate Watson natural language technology into what we're doing here. But um, you know that's kind of a, a big thing to try to do while you're also trying to convince courts to try out something new. But at least I can describe kind of what we're imagining here. So imagine that right now you just have an empty text box and you get to explain why you think you should get on a payment plan or why you think you should get bumped down. Um, you can imagine something like Watson uh, scanning that language and presenting follow-up questions. Like, oh, you said, you don't make very much money. Can you say more about exactly how much you make per month? So that you know, so 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 the questions that say a judge would probably ask um, in, in response can be asked at, in the first instance. But these are all. I mean, these are all uh, situations where people don't have lawyers or very rarely have lawyers, uh, and 
So a lot of this is just, you know, you walk in and you talk to a judge, you talk to a prosecutor, and you talk with, uh, you, you know, um, I imagine that you could have something like <clears throat> Watson take over the role of the judge, but that's really different from what we're doing. I mean, we, 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 we're not automating any of this. We are really connecting and making it, you know, simpler for people to, to access the court. So um, I assume there will be lots of ways to make this stuff faster and better and more efficient so that you don't have to have, let's say, a lot of back and forth or whatever, but, um, but that's for the future. I have the mic. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, so thank you for this talk. That was really interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your assessment plan long term. In particular, I can imagine, because we see this in other kinds of government service websites, that the people who get the most benefit from them aren't necessarily the people that you are most interested yeah. in helping. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I know that I would write a very persuasive paragraph in much the same way that when I go to court, I present in a way that makes me very appealing. Um, and I wonder How if How often you, have you gone to court? I've, I, no, I'm I, I tried. Almost <laughs> once. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, you know, if you if you've thought about that or looking at how you might assess that long-term, because I think that's actually yeah. really hard to assess in a way that, that would be meaningful, but that no. the court should see it. Yeah, MJ? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I mean, I think that's a real, I think that's a real a challenge. So I, I don't, you, you know, I mean, in an ideal world, what we have is everybody having access to a competent, skilled attorney who would present the best argument on behalf of everybody. But at least in the world we live in, people are going to have to present themselves as they are. And so in my view, the best way to kind of, it, it's true that you can probably present well in both ways, you know, both in person and in, in writing, but giving people options, I mean, I think this is an empirical question, but giving them options multiple ways may actually allow people who, who struggle on some dimensions to choose the one that's best for them. Um, and my guess is, it's, I think it's totally speculation, is that that narrows, um, narrows the difference, but I don't know that. Um, and it's, it's something we're going to have to pay attention to um, uh, going forward. I can tell you that uh, the written statements are oftentimes, you know, riddled with spelling errors, riddled with um, ungrammatical language, and, um, and yet they get the point across. You know, uh, you know they, can, they can usually get their points out. Um, and I will add, you know, again, as I mentioned with the language thing, bringing in somebody um, to accompany you to court to kind of help you, even if it's just a you know an ally, not a lawyer. Um, you can imagine um, having to write your statement, and actually having somebody who is more sophisticated help you craft that statement. Now that just says, okay, well now you're going to help people who are unsophisticated, who have sophisticated friends. Um, what about the people who don't have anybody like that? And you know, so it, it's just a rabbit hole. But um, but that's where I think for now that's what I got. We'll do one more question. Okay. okay. Um, so, yeah, really fascinating stuff. And there's this sort of efficiency, um, these metrics on efficiency, which in some ways are great, but they sort of open up the possibility of bringing more people into the yeah. system, right? So you've created capacity, um, and that doesn't sort of that yeah. doesn't address the underlying problem of poor people being saddled with a lot of yeah. um, fines and fees and so on. So. Um, and so that was sort of my dystopian read on, on the- on You're the not the only person that's had yeah. that dystopian read. <laughs> so, um, so I guess one question I have is, have you, are some of your metrics uh, sort of gained sort of not only just how many more people are paying, uh, but even gains in dollars for these courts? Because I know a lot of, you know, that's one of the critiques of some of the court fees is yeah. that they're really just making this money to be able to run and so on. Yeah. Um, are you get are you collecting those uh, metrics and then do you have some findings yet on that? Well I'll let, I'll let MJ um, add anything here, but what I'll what I'll say now is we've mostly been focusing on processes so lim you know saving of time, saving of, of effort. Um, um, we know that when people are paying their tickets after seven days instead of after four months, that's bringing bringing cash forward, which is sort of a good good thing. But to the extent um, that, uh, uh, but, you know, the, the, to, to, to work out the dystopian argument better, it's like, oh, it's much more efficient now to collect money this way. Um, I'll say that, you know, one nice thing about this system is that it's transparent. 
you know, you can, you can ask these questions explicitly. And uh, people who are interested in um, studying courts to know, you know, how, you know, how many transactions are going through this? What, 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 what are judges doing? What are prosecutors doing? Do we see people coming through the system a lot more often? A lot of that stuff, like for example, in Ferguson, I mean, their municipal courts are still using paper. So we can't even really study these questions. And here, I think that to the extent you think that a legislature or a court is someday going to have to come in and say, you got to stop using fines and fees to essentially tax people, um, I think this lays the groundwork for um, compliance with those kinds of dictates. Um, but, but my, um, you know, sort of a, a, a different kind of answer is, uh, you know, we think that even if there is that dynamic that, it, that things are becoming more efficient, we think it's, um, there's such a regressive aspect now to the way fines and fees operate that this is likely to re reduce that. It's probably gonna make everybody's life better off, but it's gonna particularly allow people who right now don't feel they can access the courts to truly engage with and communicate with judges. And, um, and so a lot of the problem with fines and fees are when people don't deal with them and they snowball. And so if we can get people to deal with them early on, um, that also makes, I think, uh, the situation much better. And I don't know if you have any, anything to add, MJ, to, to that question. Okay. Let's thank it once more. Oh, thank you very much.